On the screen, you see the outside of the Royal Society of Science in the center of London. For centuries, it has served as something of a genius club for scientists. Indeed, its history goes back to the year 1660. Over the centuries, the members of the Royal Society have included Isaac Newton, Benjamin Franklin, Michael Faraday, James Clerk Maxwell, Charles Darwin, Alexander Fleming, and Stephen Hawking, to name just a few. A few years back, in 2005, the Society held a contest. It asked a simple question. In effect, who is the greater genius, Isaac Newton or Albert Einstein? More specifically, the Society asked which famous scientist, Newton or Einstein, made a bigger overall contribution to science, given the state of knowledge during his time. Newton gave us the laws of motion, his law of gravity, a theory for understanding light and color, and a method of measuring acceleration over time and the area of curving planes, namely calculus. Einstein gave us, among other things, an understanding of light as photons, theory of relativity, both special and general, a formula for atomic energy, E equals mc squared, as well as theories about black holes, the creation of the universe, and even of parallel universes. The questionnaire of the society was sent out to 1,300 members of the general public and to 345 living member scientists of the society to the general public, and to scientists. The winner in the poll, drum roll please, Isaac Newton. The general public thought that Newton made a larger contribution to science, but only by a small amount, roughly 51 to 49 percent. But the scientists favored Newton by a wide margin, 61 to 39. Newton supporters emphasized that Newton led the transition from an era of superstition and religious dogma to the modern scientific world. In other words, Newton lived in a less scientific age than did Einstein, and therefore Newton had a heavier lift. He was more on his own. Newton himself played a large role in fashioning what we today call the Enlightenment, or again, the Age of Reason. Einstein played a role at the beginning of what we call the atomic age, the age of quantum physics. To make this point far better than I, allow me to show you a clip from a video of a lecture that Professor Douglas Stone, Rhodes Scholar and former chair of the physics department at Yale, offered annually to our Yale Genius class. Professor Stone has written a fine book on Einstein, Einstein in the Quantum, from which you have a recommended reading. Here's a very short excerpt from his class lecture on Einstein. This is the famous Solvay Conference where the most famous physicists of the world have convened. This is actually the most distinguished scientific conference in history. Half these people won the Nobel Prize. The other half probably should have. Einstein's over there in the second row, and you have Madame Curie and Poincaré and Lorentz and all the great, oh, and there's Planck, and so on. Professor Stone's lecture suggests that Einstein was by no means a loner, isolated on a desert island. He was in constant contact with, mostly through letters, but sometimes in physical proximity to the great minds of the early heyday of quantum physics. Professor Stone mentioned that a large group of physicists came annually for what was called the Solvay Conference, a sort of World Cup of physics held each year in Belgium. The strong implication here, and in Professor Stone's book, is that there was a golden age of quantum physics. So genius of the individual, like Einstein, yes, but also the genius of an age, Einstein greatly influenced by his contemporaries. What might have been other ages of genius? when great human accomplishments happened in one region and in a relatively short period of time. One might point, for example, to ancient Athens, 2,500 years ago, which produced the works of philosophers, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, the plays of Euripides and Sophocles, and the political theory of democracy, democracy at least for all free male citizens. The 10th and 11th centuries saw an Islamic golden age centered in Baghdad, modern Iraq. 13th century Paris, 
experienced a scholastic age with the rise of the University of Paris. Here clumsy Roman numerals gave way to more efficient Arabic ciphers. Time was measured exactly by the newly invented spring clock. Distances became standardized, precisely measured organ pipes, set musical pitches, and deductive thinking took hold with a thesis, sections, subsections, and sentences, leading to the paper outline that we still require of students today. Here with our course, we have weeks, sessions, and lessons, all part of the scholastic age mindset that goes back to 13th century Paris. Florence, of course, was the center of an extraordinary production of art between 1450 and 1510. Voltaire called Renaissance Florence, quote, an age of genius. 18th century Vienna was the center of a golden age of classical music with Haydn and Mozart and Beethoven. Edinburgh was the center of science in the 19th century. Berlin and the Low Countries for quantum physics around 1910, as we've seen. Mid 20th century New York for art and 21st century Silicon Valley for science and technology. If one includes ancient China, which gave us paper, printing with movable type, gunpowder, and the compass for navigation and Confucianism, and India, which gave us the Hindu religion and literature, and Hindu Arabic numerals, these ages of genius seem, and I would emphasize seem, to have moved east to west over the centuries. Shall we call it genius on the move? Here an arrow suggests the progress of genius from China to India, to the Near East, to Europe, the United States in the East, and finally all the way out west to California. Will the age of genius keep moving westward? Will it return to China? We'll get back to that question at the end of this session.